lifting indicates an expansion uh, in, in general. Those red shifts are, are uh, seen uh, from galaxy to galaxy and galactic system to galactic system. So in, uh, basically in the large scale universe, all you have is red shifting. And so basically what you have uh, is everything moving away from everything else. Uh, the best way of then analogizing the universe is just to think of it as a balloon uh, and just think that uh, there's some paint on that balloon and that uh, as the balloon is blowing up, all the paint molecules are moving away from all the other paint molecules. So something is not at the center, because there is no the center, but everything is at a center, as it were. And so everything is kind of uh, central to everything else on the surface of this balloon, uh, which represents the universe as a whole and continues to expand uh, in the way I, I just described. You sort of get it, I think, you know, just in, in, a, in a general sense. And uh, so uh, Penzias and Wilson uh, finally uh, um, uh, uh, put this together and, um, uh, and, and made a discovery which was very, very important of a 2.7 degree Kelvin uniformly distributed radiation. Um, this actually showed that it, it really did have to be a remnant of a very high energy emission at the beginning of the universe. It has to be that. And there's a lot of very good reasons, which I'm not going to go into, for saying this. But it so happens that the temperature of this, 2.7 degrees Kelvin, matches up very nicely with the Hubble redshifts. And a lot of data from the COBE satellite, the Cosmic uh, uh, um, uh, Explorer back, uh, uh, um, Background Satellite, and also the, uh, the MAP satellite, so basically uh, what you have is a whole grouping of evidence, different evidence bases that all come together around uh, a particular theory, the Big Bang Theory, in a quantitative way. Inflation was added to it later. Dark matter was added to it later. Energy, uh, uh, dark energy was added to it later. But still the model is essentially the same, and it is exceedingly well uh, corroborated. So uh, what, uh, what do people believe? You know, what does this uh, have to do with, uh, with uh, the universe? I, I'm just going to skip to uh, just a few things here really quickly. Um, uh, what people essentially believe is, okay, if the Big Bang is uh, the beginning of the universe, then we know what the age of the universe is, and uh, then the Big Bang uh, probably emerged out of a singularity. That is to say, the entire universe sort of... Uh, pushed into a single point from which point, you know, of infinite curvature of space-time, uh, the entire universe uh, uh, emerges uh, and space-time as well. So space-time, all the constants of the universe, the mass energy of the universe emerges in a single moment and uh, blows outward. Of course, there are a lot of people who would say, aha, sounds like the theory of a priest to me. Because, of course, uh, it has the, the ring of creation and so, of course, uh, um, obviously, uh, people have tried to uh, see if there are other models uh, which uh, could, um, as it were, supplant um, the Big Bang being the beginning of the universe. And it just so happens that there is a very good reason to think that there might have been a pre-Big Bang period. Uh, and that's uh, um, uh, one of the singularity theories that was uh, originally uh, formulated by Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose. A singularity theory uh, basically means this. You have a proof of a singularity, and if you can establish that, say, five conditions, in the case of Hawking and Penrose, there were five conditions. If you can establish that these five conditions actually applied to the universe, then there would have to be a singularity. Once you get a singularity, by definition, there can be no prior physical event. It would be a creation event. Well, Hawking and Penrose did come up with a singularity proof, as a matter of fact, in 1968. Uh, but their third condition uh, turned out to be violated in the 1980s when Alan Guth discovered inflationary theory. And inflationary theory actually allowed uh, for the possibility to escape uh, from the third condition uh, of, of this proof. And so all of a sudden, it looked like maybe uh, there wasn't a necessity for a creation of the universe as formerly, formerly thought. Well, that, of course, uh, you know, skipping a lot of history here, uh, it did lead, at least leave the door open to a multiplicity of possible alternatives that might have existed prior uh, to the Big Bang. 
Uh, what are some of these alternatives? I'm just going to go through it really quickly, and I don't want to, you know, uh, belabor the point too much. But I just want to. Uh, one possibility that has been uh, offered is that there was what, what's called a, a period of quantum gravity, right? Uh, this is, would be where gravity is unified with the other three cosmic forces, the electromagnetic force, the strong nuclear force, and the weak force. And, and they're, it, it's strongly interacting with these other three forces in its unity. And, and it has an entirely different physics, right? And, and so this might permit uh, the possibility uh, that the universe was in this quantum gravitational state for a long, long time. So prior to the Big Bang. Maybe an indefinite amount of time. Maybe an infinite amount of time. Maybe. And then there's another theory that uh, maybe the universe was bouncing, right? It was oscillating. So, and, and now using quantum gravity, it could have even had bounces uh, within that quantum gravity state. So that's another possibility. And, and of course, there's another possibility called a multiverse, right? So uh, Andre Linde has postulated that there, there might be a, a you know, a... a a multiverse where our universe is but, you know, a single little, uh, you know, pond, as it were, amidst this vast ocean of expanding space. And, and uh, there might be other universes in this vast expansion of expanding space. So uh, we're one little bubble universe amidst a sea of other bubble universes in a huge multiverse. And actually, uh, there can be some theoretical justification for this. So that's another possibility. So maybe... There was this pre-Big Bang period, and maybe it was in an oscillating form, and maybe it was in a multiverse form, and so forth and so on. And so for a second there, it just seemed like, okay, uh, maybe there is really no preponderance of evidence for a beginning. And then all kinds of things began to happen. So the key thing, of course, is, okay, and what begins to happen? Um, well, several different things begin to happen. The first thing is... Just think in your mind of the evidence collating in a triangle. I'm just going to talk about three kinds of evidence here that pertain to God. Two specifically pertain to a creation, and one pertains to uh, uh, what I'm going to call superintelligent design. And uh, Bruce is going to get into that in more detail momentarily. But the key thing right now is entropy. That's one point of the triangle. So somehow the law of entropy, which I'll describe in a moment, is going to foreclose some of the possibilities for an infinite or eternal universe into the past. Okay, so that's going to be one set of uh, evidence. That set of evidence, it's going to coalesce and, and corroborate another set of evidence from what's called space-time geometry. And, and, and just remember, space-time uh, in, in, in contemporary cosmology Space-time is a field. It is not an en empty vacuum, so, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a dynamic field, and the dynamic field is interacting with mass energy, and, and mass energy affects the space-time field. The space-time field, in turn, affects mass energy. It's a very, very different thing from merely a, a, an empty void. But space-time geometry, which is quite malleable, it can be compressed according to the density of mass energy in any particular region, or the density of mass energy in the universe itself, that can actually affect the geometry of space-time, so much so that maybe a singularity would be required. And that's why you can have proofs of a creation, proofs of a singularity from space-time. Think of the third point on your triangle as anthropic coincidences. Fine-tuning, highly, 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 highly improbable events. Things that, you know, n it's just impossible to explain by pure chance. And, and most physicists do not try to explain by pure chance. Indeed, they make recourse to millions and billions and trillions of additional unobserved and unobservable universes that, as it were, kind of took the denominator of the probability function and actually decreased those values by having zillions of, of uh, you know, of universes, right? You can actually decrease the probability uh, the improbability, excuse me, decrease the improbability of our universe's constants and so forth. So we're going to talk about all three very, very briefly. But these three things actually interconnect. So the law of entropy evidence connects with the space-time geometry evidence and connects with the um, anthropic coincidence evidence. 
And, and uh, I'm going to leave some of those anthropic coincidences uh, to Bruce. But let's get to entropy uh, just for a moment here, because uh, entropy is, is really key. I'm not going to go through all arguments, but just in brief, what does entropy mean? Complex, organized, ordered systems are highly, highly, highly improbable. Chaotic, scattered, and disorganized systems are highly probable. Therefore, if you have a nice, racked group of billiard balls sitting on the billiard table, and you take a cue ball, and you hit that cue ball right into the, into the midst of all of those uh, racked billiard balls, and all the racked billiard balls suddenly scatter off in all kinds of different directions, you're not surprised. You're not surprised. 